Oh, hello. I'm Paul Watson, and welcome again to Written by the Rest, the Forgotten History podcast that makes you ask the question, can you find me a 1920s Elon Musk and Kanye West hybrid? You bet your left nut we can. I'm here for a moment, at least, with my co-host and guest, Sam Nicholson. Hi, Sam. Hi. How are you? Good. How are you? Yeah, I'm all right. Not too yeah. bad. Yeah. We're recording this on a Saturday, so we're pretty chilled out. We're pretty relaxed. I mean, yeah, the, the um, Elon Musk Kanye West hybrid certainly has my interest peaked. Mm-hmm. Yeah, this is going to be a good episode. Yeah. I've got a good feel. It's my first biography. Oh. So this will be good. First one. Yeah. We'll see if it's any good and if people actually like it. Popping your biographical cherry. Mm-hmm. That's right. I can't wait. So before <laughs> before we start, though, I, I, want, I want to mention, I, I typically buy a book, at least one book, and I use a lot of other sources, of course. And for this episode, I bought Henry Ford's autobiography, autobiography, My Work and Life, which I'll link a copy to under my uh, sources in the description. Um, but I managed to actually pick up a hundred-year-old copy. It was really cool. Wow. Like 1922. Cool. Like It was like a seventh printing, but it was, it was really good. Four pound delivered. Chuffed. And it's in great condition. Blows my mind. Smells like old book. And it's the driest thing I've ever read. Honestly. He spends about three pages talking about the different types of steel. Wow. Yeah. So, Sam, Henry Ford. Ring any bells? Uh, yeah. Occasionally. Yeah. Um... Obviously, the cars, mainly. Yeah, he founded the Ford Motor Company. He did. Did lots of business. Yeah, made a lot of cars. Yeah, he, ha- he helped essentially make modern mass production as we know it today. Yeah, created uh, lots of jobs. Lots and lots, lots of, of jobs. Lots of wealth, presumably. Lots of we- richest man in the world yeah. at one point. I think he was he was richest man in the world for like most of the 20s. Mm. A, a true titan of industry. Yes, and one thing we've learned from all rich people is they're all perfectly normal. All of the time. Yeah. With the exception of Henry Ford, who was a massive anti-Semite and inspired literal Nazis with his ideology, we've got an episode on our hands. I mean, I, I, <laughs> the literal Nazis part shocked me. Um, <laughs> and the anti-Semite part shocked me as well, to be fair. But <laughs> I'd argue he's not unusual amongst super rich people. What, being anti-Semites? Or? Well, just being a bit of a dickhead. Yeah, true. Uh, I mean, again, the Elon Musk comparison here yeah, runs I, deep. I think Bill Gates gets too much hate for a guy that essentially just wants to help people, I think. I could do an episode on, uh, on yeah. him at some point, I reckon. Um, oh yeah, he's he's not everything he seems either. But well, you sound like Russell Brand there. Day. That's for another day. Um, but yeah, Elon Musk certainly is a bit of a twat. Mm-hmm. Um, sorry, carry on. That's all right. So... Henry Ford was born July 30th, 1863, in Springwells Township, Michigan. Sounds lovely. It it does. What's not so lovely is that he lived on a farm um, with his father, William Ford, and mother, Mary Ford. He had four siblings, as was the style at the time, because you need all of that sweet, sweet free farm (laughs) labour. Henry was educated in a simple one-room primary school. He never attended high school, which again was a style at the time, which wasn't all that uncommon, really. Um, Living and probably needing to work on that farm, you needed all that free labour, which you did probably from birth. Plus they were presumably Catholics. I I don't know. I don't don't think they were. I'm not sure. They might have been. I don't know. uh, So so Ford's Ford's mother was Irish. So actually, yes, they could have been. Yeah, yeah, they probably were. Maybe Protestants. There wasn't a lot of access to... Contraception in the first place, and being Catholic, obviously, yeah, don't tend to use contraception. No, so four kids makes sense. Yeah, probably a little too few, if anything. <laughs> yeah, just pack it in. Three's yeah. enough. Uh, turns out he wasn't a fan of working on the farm. Um, when his mother died, he was quoted as saying, "I never had particular love for the farm. It was a mother on the farm that I loved." Oh, bless him. Bless his cottons. So for the late 19th century, he had a pretty typical upbringing. Um, He wasn't from any major privilege. Um, He has a few advantages that others don't, which we'll touch on. They certainly didn't go hungry either, but they were by no means rich, Mm. which is pretty rare for people who end up being horribly rich. And in fact, the richest people in the world. I mean, yeah, the richest people in the world usually come from horrendous suffering, don't they? And they, they climb out from under the parapet of poverty and become insanely wealthy. 
Yeah, so like Elon Musk's father, for example, mm. owns fucking emerald mines in South Africa. No, no, he, 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 was, a, he was a working class South African hero, wasn't he? Uh, yeah, yeah, that was it. Yeah, Who yeah. just happens to have you're, a few you're emerald mistaken. mines. You're mistaken. <laughs> Who has a few emerald mines knocking Elon about. Elon Musk is a self-made man. Don't, <laughs> don't tell me otherwise. Mm. At the age of 12, he was given a pocket watch by his father. And by the age of 15, he was able to disassemble and reassemble watches for his friends and neighbours. Um, I know what I was doing at the age of 15, and it definitely wasn't putting watches together. You know what? I, I tried to learn to do that recently, and I can tell you for free, it's really fucking difficult. Yeah. But when you live on a farm in the middle of Michigan, I imagine you don't have an awful lot to keep you busy. Well, yeah, but he hasn't got YouTube to learn either, whereas no, I did. No, I think YouTube had a few more years Yeah, to it go wasn't before. quite there yet, was no, it? No, no, early days. Yeah. But he went on to build his first steam engine at the age of 15 as well, which again is something I didn't really bother with at 15. I think I maybe waited until I was at least 17. Yeah, I mean, we, we were too busy building spreadsheets and websites, weren't we? Time's yeah. changed. <laughs> yeah, I, I struggled with connects back in those <laughs> days. So apparently he's originally considered electricity for an engine as well, but apparently the batteries were too heavy and impractical and the range wasn't great. And oil was cheaper. And oil was a hell of a lot cheaper. Along with getting his pocket watch, another formative event in his life, or his early life at least, was seeing the operation of a Nichols and Shepherd Road engine. These are engines that you see at steam shows nowadays, but they were basically used um, in, on farms to run things like sawmills and threshing machines and things okay. like that. And he, he does say in his biography it was one of his very formative experiences for wanting to build a car. And that's when he ends up spending about four pages talking about the position of a boiler on a machine and I, my eyes glazed over as I was trying to read it. I mean, to, to write an autobiography and spend that much time on the inner workings of machinery is quite telling in a way, isn't it? it it's, yeah. it's a person that didn't either have a lot of personal experiences or didn't value them as much as technical knowledge. No, he, he spends a lot of his biography talking about work, and obviously his biography is called My Life and Work, but work is encompass his life it encompasses his life it's all he talks about in his yeah. biography it was a very eye-opening read actually but yeah it was boring as hell i can't stress that enough <laughs> so we're piecing together here absolutely jack shit to entertain a child in the 1870s to the point that seeing an engine for the first time which to be fair was probably pretty cool um, and a watch is enough to focus him into engineering using his hands and his head to build stuff which is you know, in a pretty depressing time to be alive. Yeah, I think, I think, like you said, seeing an engine back then would have been revolutionary, wouldn't it? it would oh, yeah. Have, it would have been mind-blowing. Yeah, I suppose so. Especially something moving... Yeah, like like a, a moving... Uh, a horseless carriage. ...thing like that would have been something yeah. spectacular, yeah. It would have inspired yeah. many a person, I'd imagine. Exactly, yeah. Fair enough. Like other people at the time, Ford eventually grew up, uh, and in 1879, at the age of 16, he took his first job as a machine machinist's apprentice in Detroit. He helped maintain steam engines at this point, and like many other teenagers today, he really got into his cars, eventually making it his entire personality. Ford married in 1888 to Clara Jane Bryant and had one son, Edsel Ford. They actually ended up living on a farm that his father gave him, so yeah, that privilege kind of showing yeah. a little bit there. Pretty much just to keep everyone off his back. His family wanted him to be a farmer and work on a farm and own a farm. I think he was given like 40 acres to play with. So he was like farming and, I don't know, Sowing corn, rearing cattle, all the while kind of building cars in the background? Yeah, pretty much. So he, he actually ends up working for bulb investor Thomas Edison. You might have heard of that guy. Doesn't ring a bell, no. Yeah, he made bulbs and electricity yeah. and stuff. He ended up being... Nikola Tesla? I've got Thomas no, Edison. Oh, it's Thomas here. Edison. Yeah, that, no, you're yeah. thinking of someone else. Yeah, sorry, yeah, I'm getting mixed up. Yeah. <laughs> sorry. Different guy. He became their chief engineer, and Edison actually helped fund some of uh, Ford's early startups, wow. which is quite interesting. But but it's interesting because Edison was like, no, 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 you need an electric car, son. Come on, let, let's mm. get... And he was like, no, 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 no. Yeah. Ford, however, as, as I mentioned, did spend pretty much every working minute on engines, be they steam or otherwise. And by 1892, he'd finished his first car. So being one of the first people in the world to have a car, you can imagine the sort of reaction that people had. What, what was, was Henry Ford the first person to make a car? No. No, no he, he, he is a bit behind the curve here. Okay. You're, so Germans, uh, Mercedes-Benz, they were building cars before him and they actually were selling cars in, in, in the United States as well. But at this point, at least, 
cars are practically non-existent. Yeah. People did have them, but they weren't as yeah. we know it today. They weren't kind of mainstream. So actually, some of Ford's early startups, as it were, before he created the Ford Motor Company, he was building cars, but they were completely ad hoc. And it right. was against everything that Ford wanted to do. Ford wanted to make a cheap car that is easily replicable. Mass market. Mass stuff. market. You get cheap parts. Yeah. They were easily made. They weren't just one-offs one person, one rich person. Mm-hmm. They would be a car that every person could buy. Like his, his adage of, he wanted people to be able to buy his car who worked in the factory. And that was true. They yeah. could. So begin, like I say, being one of the first people, I say, let's say in America, to have a car. <laughs> it was interesting. I, I read this point is that the mayor at the time had to give him a handwritten and signed letter to basically let the police leave him alone because he kept getting bothered. He had to chain his car up to lampposts because people kept trying to either start it or they were just getting surrounded by people as he was trying to go about his day. Quote, for a time I enjoyed the distinction of being the only licensed chauffeur in America, which I think is actually pretty cool. That is pretty cool. It is pretty cool. So so do you know when Mercedes started building cars roughly? Was, no, it, was, it I think long, it, was it long before? Uh, I think they, they were definitely building cars after because there's a point in his book where he talks about going to a almost like a showroom and seeing a Mercedes up for sale. So right. He okay. was definitely he was definitely he was behind them. Yeah. yeah he was behind yeah, Mercedes yeah, Benz. Sure. Um so yeah, pretty cool story. Uh, he's not a complete weirdo, and also, unlike most people who become world's richest people, they're actually from reasonable, humble backgrounds. I think that's a good reflection so far. Granted, his father did give him 40 acres of land, to which I assume included a house and a fully kitted out workshop. I suppose land at that point wasn't as valuable as we kind of see it now. Yeah, especially, especially in, in sort of middle America. Yeah, um, Detroit. Yeah. Um, <laughs> I, I remember thinking it's on definitely this... Definitely not as valuable now in Detroit. <laughs> definitely not. I remember thinking, actually, as I, as I was writing this script, that <laughs> he's the equivalent of starting his own company out of his parents' garage. He's Jeff Bezos. Yeah. He he got given his garage by his parents, yeah. loads of land, and he got to start his business from it. He is, pretty much. He is the, the 1920s Jeff Bezos. Right. I'm obviously skipping some things here, um, because in all honesty, his early life isn't super interesting, but he continues building cars, and by the beginning of the 20th century, he has formed the Ford Motor Company. In June 1903, he began building the very company that we know today. The years that followed, he did lots of cool stuff. And again, this isn't what this podcast is about, but I'm going to touch on them. So he developed the modern assembly line. He reduced the cost per unit and increased efficiency of building Fords. Did you know his assembly line tech is still used today in car manufacturing? I did not know that. What, like the actual designs of it? The the, the layout of the assembly line he created huh. is still used today in yeah. manufacturing, yeah. He, he goes into this in his book a lot. And again, I don't want to delve into the detail too much, but he, he literally thought out everything. He mm. used to think out the space that a worker would need to do yeah. their job in a safe manner yeah, yeah so not giving them too little but not giving them too much so he used the absolute just the exact mm-hmm. amount of space they needed to build a car yeah. he, or for he, that person to build a car he, he literally changed industry as a whole mm. um, I, I work in the furniture industry personally outside yeah. of this podcast and again in that industry the production lines are based on henry ford's principles of how it should run Exactly. Yeah. No, it, it's it's fascinating mm. stuff. I mean, he, he also introduced the five day wage, which uh, at the time was groundbreaking. He doubled the, mm. the average daily wage for the time. This was around 1914. He did eventually end up actually making six dollars as well, which is less talked about because it's less cool. He came up. He, he didn't come up with a five day working week, but he was certainly one of the early industrialists to promote it and actually implement it. Yeah. The government had some forms of five day working week and 40 hour weeks at the time. He developed Fordism as an economic system, Mm -hmm. which emphasises efficiency and mass production, which, again, wasn't completely new. There were were forms of mass production at this point, but Ford definitely made it a thing and made it much more mainstream. Everyone started following what Ford did, because he did it best. This is a completely different aside but have you seen ford versus ferrari it's a it's no. a movie no what's that uh, it's about the the f1 race sort of in the in the 20s and 30s mm. and it's kind of about the the mass market appeal of the ford mm. and how they tried to also make f1 cars at the same time yeah and then the the artisan of ferrari and, mm. and how the two kind of competed it's about the two drivers at the time as well but it's, it's a really good movie yeah, it, it's by james mangold he did logan i might give that a look mm. Uh, interestingly enough, though, Ford wasn't actually that interested in building race cars. No. He, he did it as a means it to an end. It was a marketing end. tool. Wasn't it was it? a marketing tool, yeah, because at the time, it was about who had the fastest car, not actually how cheap or yeah. well it ran. Which it was, is, is it quick? Yep, I'll buy it. Makes it even more interesting because you have Ferrari who are very much making an F1 car. 
and, and kind of everything else comes off it. Whereas Ford is the opposite approach, and it's kind of the two the two sort of meet in the middle. It's it's really mm. clever. Yeah, yeah, I like it. Be- yeah, because again, no one was really doing what Ford was doing at the time. Everyone just built cars for rich people. Yeah, which granted probably made a lot of money, but it was all yeah. ad hoc. Instead of producing a hundred cars a year, a year Ford could produce 500, 5,000. Mm. I think one of his aims in the early days was to produce 500 cars in a day, and that was unheard of. People thought it was insane, but I, he managed it. He did yeah. it. With every industry, somebody has to have that stance, don't they, of trying to to, mm. to shrink the cost of the tech. Yeah, exactly, exactly. And he did that. Like I say, it's down to the nuts and bolts mm. that he used. He did everything to shave off cost and increase efficiency. But all in all, pretty good stuff considering capitalism at the time. Granted, five-day weeks come from striking, which Ford was overtly and adamantly against in all forms. He absolutely hated unions. It's a bit like the British government, isn't it? Yeah, that's very topical. Well done. Mm. Um, he, yeah, he hated unions. He didn't think they brought any value. He ended up having almost like union busters working for him at, at certain points. Well, like um, union busters in like the... Uh, I wouldn't the say mob. violent ones, no. no I, I, but he certainly had people who, who worked against them um, and on his payroll. So, so far, he's built a company from the ground up, taken majority control, and he continues to build up the business, releasing the Model T. By the start of the end of the 1910s, he's pretty much one of the richest men on the planet at this point. And this is where things take an obvious turn for the expected. Before we go any further, uh, we've discussed this already, Sam. It's Mm. worth filling people in here that Jewish people in the, the first half of the 20th century really weren't given an easy living in the U.S., or Europe, or pretty much anywhere at the time. And it's worth putting into context a little bit here. Antisemitism was quite rife. It was up there with, with racism. Mm. And I'm not excusing this, and I, I, I definitely agree to somewhat with the of the time of a person. So someone being racist or someone being anti-Semitic, I don't agree with it. But what I'm going to talk about with, with Henry Ford here is that he took it a bit too far, and we're going to go into that now. Yeah. Okay. So just to, to fill this in a little bit, it, it, it was no easy. With a large volume of Jewish immigrants entering the country from around 1860 and peaking in the 1920s, this pretty much covers the entirety of Ford's life up to date. So when you're a billionaire, all of a sudden, two things tend to happen. One, you become a voice of thought leadership for other people. So automatically, people will listen to you. Not entirely unreasonable. You no. are good at a particular thing, so people will hear you out when you have other things to say. And two, you have the ability and the power to buy your platform. So you can force your opinions, whether they be right or wrong, on people who will listen. So Sam, you're the equivalent of Jeff Bezos. You're worth billions and billions of dollars in today's money. You don't have Twitter in 1920. I think MySpace was probably about three or four years away at this point. Tom was just kind of readying the code, wasn't he? Mm -hmm. Ready to launch. launch. How are you going to get the message out there about your horrible, horrible views on a specific group of people. I'd probably buy a newspaper. Funnily you should say that, Sam, because that's exactly what Henry oh, Ford interesting. did. He bought a freaking newspaper. Which one? He bought a, a newspaper called the Dearborn Independent in 1919. Oh, I'd probably go bigger than that. What, than an independent newspaper? Yeah. Well, what are you thinking, like The Sun? The USA Today? I was thinking like The New York Times, maybe. Yeah. Was that not around? No, well, the point that yes, it was. I think the point with the the Dearborn Independent was it was a failing newspaper, so it wasn't doing very well, and he got it cheap. Oh, okay. So it, it had all the infrastructure. But, but he's also a titan of industry. He's one of the great industrialists of our time. Surely he could have afforded to do a Murdoch and buy something. Maybe big. maybe this was his plan, and he wanted to build upon it. But yeah, maybe. He, he did he did build it up. So I mean, ultimately buying the newspaper, there was nothing wrong with that in principle. But he doesn't leave it at that. He begins using the me- uh, the newspaper as a vehicle. <laughs> pun intended, um, to push his anti-Semitic propaganda. Over the next two years and over 90 editions, Ford laid into the Jews, blaming everything on them from controlling banks and everything in between. Wow. He even discussed at the time what was being banded around as the Jewish question. Dude. A question that someone else picks up a few decades later, as we all know. That's Hitler, by the way. Uh, just in <laughs> case you weren't aware, you sat there scratching your head. Who is asking this question? Henry Ford and, it was Fred- Henry Ford and Frederick Nietzsche. They've got a lot to answer for. <laughs> so they eventually got published into a four-volume set. Now, <laughs> I didn't read all of these. I read some of them. But I want to share some of the titles of some of these articles. Sam, would you like to hear them? No, but you're going to tell me anyway, aren't you? Yes, I am. Otherwise, there's, well, there's going to be some quiet time. <laughs> Anti-Semitism. 
Will it appear in the US? Yes. I think it's safe to say it will. <laughs> this one's my favourite. I've say, I, I, Actually, I'm going to save that one for last. Degradation of American baseball. I knew it. The damn Jews. Do you know what? These sound like <laughs> the kind of YouTube video titles you get to when you get really deep into a conspiracy session. Right into a rabbit hole. Yeah. 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 Jewish um, degradation of American football. How dare he? And also, uh, another good one, Germany's reaction against the Jew. Oh, Jesus, Henry. Oh, Henry. Hun. What are you doing? Read the fucking room. Read the room. Well, the room in the 20s was... like it's still the pretty shit, the, to be fair. Oh, yeah. Obviously, it's awful. It's a pretty shit room. But um, keep in mind that at the time as well, the, the, the Nazi party, party was actually fledgling. Um, we'll touch on this in a little bit, but uh, the final one, this is my favourite. <clears throat> Jewish jazz becomes our national music? <laughs> what? <laughs> what does that mean? Fuck me. He was blaming the jazz movement on the Jews. You know what? I think that this is... It's a horrible thing to say. It's really eye-opening. But if you think of the the Sun, for example, it's um, a newspaper. Yeah, it's a newspaper in the UK. Sorry, owned by Rupert Murdoch. Mm. Twenty years ago, thirty years ago, their line and arguably still is is all on immigration mm. and them to, and immigrants taking control and, yep. and changing things and ruining things. This is exactly what it's been Ford going on for a hundred years. It doesn't and end. More, it doesn't end. The, 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 the Jews of today are Muslims. We exactly. blame Muslims for Muslims everything. We or the Polish or what, the, whatever the it is. Nazis. Yeah, this yeah. never stops. It just it. This is what annoys me about it history. Changes. We constantly repeat ourselves. Yeah. It never ends. <laughs> and these go on complaining about how Jews are bringing communism to America and literally ruining everything. There's, it's pretty much not a subject he doesn't touch upon. Obviously, finance being the biggest thing here. Why would the Jews bring communism to America? So this is a this was a bit of a rhetoric that there was quite a lot of communist Jews. But the thing is with. Judaism is obviously you can have different political views. You can be a left-leaning exactly. Jew, you can be a right-leaning Jew, you can be a centrist Jew. You, it's not a political mindset. You can is be it? a communist, you can be a capitalist, you, anything. Like it's a fucking faith. There's no, there's no. Yeah, it's a faith. It's not a direction of your entire life. Ford was also inspired by uh, a book called The Protocol Protocols of the Elders of Zion. That, that sounds healthy. Right. It was a book that was written by Russians about 20 years earlier. I, again, I won't go into the detail, but it, it's a very awful book, and it's very stereotyping Jews for everything you can imagine. It's it's horrible. It's full of conspiracy theories. And in fact, if you do ever happen to go down a YouTube rabbit hole mm. and you're an anti-Semite, you, you will get a lot of people quoting this stuff to this very yeah. day, 100 years later, 120 years later. There's a, there's a recent-ish book called, I think it's The Empire of Atlantis, and that, that kind of, it propagates these Jewish stereotypes and kind of goes into how Atlanteans are effectively the Aryan race, mm. and, and there's an ancient battle between them and effectively the Jews. Um, huh. That's a new one. Yeah, so so the the Nazis in particular saw themselves as these Aryan Atlanteans mm -hmm. battling against this other force of the the Jewish people from from prehistory. Okay. Yeah. It's pretty fucking That's an awful. interesting one. I don't think he was inspired by that fortune. No, I'm sure, I'm sure Henry Ford wasn't in particular, but it's a uh, it's a it's a facet of history that is um well it's not history it's it's pure conspiracy yeah yeah Ford pushes his newly purchased newspaper or pamphlet whatever you want to call it through door to door subscriptions he went as far as forcing his nationwide chain of dealerships to take subscriptions and give out copies even going as far as including copies in newly sold cars now I don't know about you Sam but I prefer personally prefer an extended warranty with my car but that's just me yeah not a pamphlet on anti semitism particularly no. At this point, he's getting pretty obsessed to the umpteenth degree. From the titles and and the way he's forcing this so adamantly, he's 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 losing grip on reality, in my opinion. I don't, I don't know about you. What are your thoughts on this? I've I've got a genuine question at this point. So Henry Ford was this this huge industrialist. Yeah. Um, and and Ford even even kind of now, their sort of corporate slogan is or was until recently by American. Yeah. Do you think this? Rhetoric by Henry Ford was something to do with trying to push the buy American agenda rather than buying foreign cars? I don't know. You know what? That's an interesting question. So, obviously, 
Ford was a, an American through and through, mm. and he sold mostly in America. But as time went by, especially towards the end of his life, he did end up selling his cars elsewhere and building his cars elsewhere. So, for example, Germans built his cars. Yeah, I mean, that, that, that doesn't mean that he'd want Americans to stop buying them, does it? Do, do, no. you, know, do you know what I mean? It's, it's kind of, it's pushing this American car for American people rhetoric. Mm. And obviously, he doesn't see Jewish people as American people. Is it maybe? I mean, he, he, I'm, I'm just thinking: is it a marketing vehicle, or is it genuinely what he thinks? I think we see time and time again with with people with a platform and, and billionaires. They often exaggerate their own sort of feelings mm, to kind of sell things. See now, from reading his book, not and that that's any better. By no, the way. no, no, of course not. But from reading his book and what I understand about. Ford is yeah, he's actually a really simplistic man. He his idea on the world is if you all work hard enough, if you all put in your time and you all get good at doing what you do, the world will do better. That's his capitalist view. It's actually the proper it, industrialist. He's an industrialist yeah. through and through. Yeah, I don't think his agenda is he? this is almost he's an industrialist. A, yeah, yeah. He, I think his agenda is completely separate. I don't think he's using it to put because he doesn't he doesn't talk about Ford, as it were, he just mm. talks about his own horrible opinions. So yeah, I, I get where you're coming from. Though. Yeah, That's just, a really just, interesting just a thought. Yeah. Now, thankfully, the Jewish community, quite rightly, aren't standing for any of this shit. And they don't buy Fords. And they don't buy Fords. And he's sued in the early 20s by a chap called Aaron Shapiro. Shapiro making a name for himself organising farmers into cooperative associations during the early 20s. A damn socialist. I hope he's not related to Ben Shapiro. That would be awkward, wouldn't it? That would be awkward. I did think that writing it down. I didn't look into it. <laughs> I, we'll, we'll, leave that, we'll, leave that, we'll leave that for another day. But yeah, you know, coming here, trying to make people's lives better. Yeah. Um, he decided Dickhead. to call Ford out on his crappy opinions. So Shapiro, around 1924, sued Ford and the Dearborn Independent for a million dollars, um, which is about $14 million in today's money, Quite and probably $50 million in tomorrow's money, <laughs> the way inflation's going. Especially against the pound. Right. Ford's defence was diminished responsibility. He claimed that he never wrote anything and wasn't involved in it, despite putting his name to oh, the end yes. of every right at the end of every article. Yeah. However, eventually Ford does retract. He he actually issues a full retraction, which I found interesting at the time because the Jewish community were actually pretty chill about it. About eighty percent of kind of Jewish communities were like, "Okay, you, you've apologised. You've made an effort," yeah. which again is more mm -hmm. than what most billionaires would do these days most of them would just double down and become even worse yeah i think it's also a sort of symptomatic of the jewish people throughout history as well i mean they've 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 been through more than any other culture could Arguably, possibly yeah. comprehend thousands really. of years of it yeah and one they're still here and two they're, they're still they still have a lot of humility it's it's crazy yeah that i, I was surprised to read that there was yeah. a, it was a genuine article about how the, the jewish community to a large extent kind of Forgive might be a strong word, but they yeah. certainly wanted to put it to rest and like, just be like, okay. Thousands of years of oppression, and that's still the, the standard yeah. point. It's, it's pretty, something pretty to big. Be, pretty it's pretty big. pretty special, isn't it? Yeah, that's uh, pretty, it's pretty cool. They could yeah. easily be like, no. Yeah, fuck um, you. The Dearborn Independent closed down a few years later. It didn't last much longer after that, right. um, and, and, and the paper was, was no more. But ultimately, though, the, the damage had been done. None of his work was ever copyrighted, so essentially he... He had a copy of newspapers and books, but which pretty much anyone could do anything they wanted with. Which, whether he knew that or not, I don't know. But, like I say, these got turned into books and anthologies and they were printed and they sold quite a lot. See, the Nazis. The International Jew was translated into German around 1922 and went on to inspire many up-and-coming young Nazis at the time. In fact, Ford met with Karl Lundeck. Um, I'm probably pronounced that incorrectly, in the early 20s to try and garner some cash from Ford for the Nazi party because they felt that ideologies matched and aligned so much. Quote, When Ludeck finally developed his courage to make the pitch to Ford, with consummate, <laughs> with consummate Yankee skill, steered the conversation away from money and back to stereotypes. It's worth mentioning he didn't give the Nazis any money. I want to make that clear. Um, <laughs> he well, pretty much told them to go away. Least. Yeah. Now, this didn't stop Ford's work from inspiring a generation of literal Nazis at the time. Um, a chap called um, Bido von Scherer, who actually eventually became the head of the Hitler Youth, wow. said, and I quote, I read it and I became an anti-Semite. 
In those days, this made such a deep impression on my friends and myself because we saw Henry Ford as a representation of success. And he's, this kind of takes me back again to what I was saying earlier. This guy's done something really, really good. He's grown a business from nothing. He's become a billionaire of the time. He's the richest man in the world. Even though he's just good at building cars, people don't care. He's a successful person, so therefore he must be a, he must be a thought leader in other areas. In, yeah. in this case, anti-Semitism. The issue, the issue isn't that he had those feelings, as, as bad as that is. The yeah. issue is that he had this massive platform with which to share those feelings and yeah. chose to. And again, as, as we see today, we, we revere wealth. Yeah. Especially if it's created from nothing. Um, I mean, even Elon Musk, the example, yes, he had a good start in life and lots of wealth behind him, but mm. he's still done very well to okay. create fair, yeah, what fair, he has um, out of that he's wealth. He's a billionaire still, but... You know, he's, he's gone from being wealthy to the richest man in the world. He, mm. He's done well for himself, arguably, financially, but his views and his methods are still incorrect and wrong. Yeah. And I think that will always be the same. When it, whenever... But if he was poor, no one would listen to him. Exactly. <laughs> and the issue with capitalism is, one, that we revere wealth, and two, we give those wealthy people the loudest voices. Yes. So their viewpoints get imprinted on our world and our personalities and our viewpoints, and that isn't right. No. Adolf Hitler himself considered Ford to be an inspiration of a man too, not only as an anti-Semite, but as an industrialist and a leader. In fact, if you've if you've ever read Mein Kampf, have you ever read Mein Kampf, Sam? I've not had the pleasure. No, me neither. I decided against it. I think it's a classic. It's been out for a while. Yeah. Hitler mentions Ford as a, and I quote, a great man, was also known for having a picture of Ford on his desk in Munich, as well as copies of his translated international Jew volumes. I kind of wish he had a tattoo on his arse cheek or something of Henry Ford's face. Yeah, just like Ford. Yeah. The actual or just, just the word Ford. Yeah, yeah, yeah just the, the, badge. the badge. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Or Fiesta. We never, we'll never know, <laughs> do we? We'll never know. If he had Mondeo on his, on his back. It would have been like Model A, though, at that point, or Model, yeah. Model T. He has other connections with Germany and the Germans around having car plants, uh, as I mentioned earlier, but won't be going into that as this is only a 30, and 45, 30 to 45 minute podcast, not a three hour one. I did read a few things apparently about Jewish slave labour being used in Ford plants. That's a bit of a, that's a, bit of a mis, misunderstanding. When Ford did have plants in Germany, but Ford didn't control them. Obviously, especially when we went to war, Ford lost all control of those plants. They were used for building things like planes and bombs and other things, as yeah. well as cars. But, I mean, up to that point, is there any evidence of... No, no, there's not really. There might be that I've missed, but as far as I'm aware, he didn't collaborate enough with the Germans. In fact, the Germans were pushing to build German-only cars, and that's why Volkswagen did so well. Yeah. But again, as a, as a conversation for another day... Mm. So in, in July 1938, only a few months after the German annexation of Austria, he accepted the highest medal that a German Nazi could bestow on a foreigner, the Grand Cross of the German Eagle. Do you think it's interesting that the, the Germans kind of revered the Eagle, especially when it comes to Nazism, and then the American symbol of freedom is effectively the, the bald eagle? I can't say I've ever thought of it that way, but yeah, I suppose so. I just have right now, for the first time. Boom. Yeah, Discoveries. There we go. There we go. It's worth noting, however, at the tail end of Ford's life, he did renounce a lot of his anti-Semitic views. But unfortunately, as I mentioned previously, it was too little and too late for a lot of people who likely were indirectly killed because of Ford view Ford's views. And yeah, I'm going to make a big enough jump there. He inspired Nazis, especially early on in the party, to be anti-Semitic, to hate Jews. Now, don't get me wrong, there was a lot of other stuff going along at the time. Hitler had lots of influences. It wasn't just Ford, but he was certainly one of them, and he was certainly one that he regarded. He, Like I say, he literally had a picture in his office of him. People to this day still listen to people like Ford like they're an authority, just because they're good. Hell, even great at a thing doesn't mean that you can run 100 metres in less than eight seconds or tell someone how they can do it, or how I can cook a good risotto. I can't do either. Ford died in April 7th, 1947, of a brain hemorrhage after having a fair few strokes in his final years. In fact, some people have said that seeing newsreels of the concentration camps being liberated was actually probably one of the reasons that he had his final stroke, or what pushed him to have that final stroke. What, because Coming... he was unhappy that Jewish people were free? 
no, he, he was coming face to face with potentially what he had part in influencing others to do. He he felt guilty in the end. Really? Uh, he was it's definitely it's definitely recorded that he re- renounced a lot of what he said. He was unfortunately kind of losing his marbles a bit in the end, so I can't put too much faith in that. But apparently, yeah, the, the seeing some of the newsreels of the liberated camps was probably what killed him, or at least helped. So push things along sort of from a, a person that doesn't spend as much time researching as you admittedly or researching at all um, <laughs> that's the point of having you on this podcast Sam. <laughs> i don't want you to research for, for me what i understand about the rise of nazism and that sort of thing is that the biggest influence on on hitler and the nazi party was was nietzsche not you know, I've never heard Henry Ford in the discussion at all. Oh, don't get me wrong. Like I say, I really want to stress a point here. He wasn't the only influence. There was loads of influence. Yeah, Nietzsche was was, yeah. was one of them. But there was loads. Like I say, the oh, Elders of course. Zion yeah. I mentioned earlier. Yeah. Like, that was influential. Hitler quotes that a lot in Mein Kampf. The story about um, Atlantis as well, presumably. I wouldn't be surprised. He, he was involved in lots of conspiracy yeah. theories and thought there was magic and treasure around yeah, the world. Yeah, the esoteria and the occult was Hitler's bag. Yeah, he loved all that kind of stuff. I, but I could see, certainly see from Ford's final years or even final days, seeing those new re- newsreels and thinking, hell, I've, I've been quoted, I've been mentioned in mm. his biography. I might have had, I might have been a reason some of this has happened, or at least I'm a reason that I've given him some influence to want to do that. I've been another voice. Mm. And yeah, that's pretty terrible. I, I would... I think I mean, that would probably finish me off. Yeah, I mean, he he wouldn't be the only sort of so-called great man throughout history to be um, credited with those kinds of views. No. I, you know, I might be being a bit extreme with it, but that, that's no, no. just my thoughts. Just, but yeah. yeah, I mean, look, there's there's just to kind of wrap up here, there's so, so much on Ford. Uh, we've only had a taster today, but if you, if you have a chance, I encourage anyone to read up on him, learn a bit more. He lived a very interesting life and he lived in very interesting times as well. Um, as always, we'll finish up as usual. Please like, share, review, tell your therapist and chiropractor. And this podcast, even tell your chiropodist if you get chance. Uh, I know that I do on a regular basis. But absolutely do not tell anyone who knows anything about history. I'm 100% adamant about that and I will not move on it. Sam, do you have any pluggables? I do. My YouTube channel, at Sammy Shares TV. We don't talk about history, but we do talk about TV, movies, science nerd culture and anything anything that tickles my fancy really yeah. we, we talk about it's um, pretty cool whatever you want so yeah come come along hang out say hi cool and if you like this particular podcast um feel free to get in touch i've started including socials in the description i've had my first listeners outside of the uk and english speaking countries yeah. so i've had i've had someone from chile I've had uh, someone from india and i've had i'm actually getting quite a few from belgium so if you're listening from belgium hello thank you I All three of you. I imagine they are British people in, in Belgium. <laughs> yeah, someone with a VPN. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, it's someone using NordVPN. You should get a sponsor. Yeah, uh, yeah I should. Everyone yeah. sponsors NordVPN. I'm not sponsoring NordVPN. <laughs> so we'll be back next week. I'm thinking of doing an episode on something called the Mau Mau Rebellion. If you've not heard about it, don't read it because I want to tell you loads of stuff about it and it's absolutely brutal and horrible. I'm going to have to put a trigger warning on it. But any thoughts from yourself, from the audience, from anyone, let me know. Bye-bye.